which brings us directly to our next uh, member of the Belmarsh Tribunal, uh, which is Selai Gafar, the spokesperson for the Solidarity Party of Afghanistan. Dear comrades and friends, I'm thrilled and honored to join you on this historical tribunal. All Afghans, particularly the families of the war victims, expect the Belmarsh Tribunal to heal their wounds by holding the United States accountable for the thousands of innocent Afghans' lives they destroyed and the future they stole. And I salute the Progressive International for this remarkable initiative. In the week of the U.S. humiliating withdrawal from Afghanistan, everybody asks this question. How did the two decades of the U.S. military occupation of Afghanistan under the pretext of fighting terrorism ended with the Taliban terrorists gaining a swift and easy victory in Afghanistan? Well, so far, in my opinion, only one person by the name of Julian Assange possibly had the answer to this mystery. In 2011, he unmasked the truth through a set of documents called the Afghan War Diary, where he exposed the tyrannical U.S. policy in Afghanistan and said that one of the goals behind sustaining the war was to, to wash many out of the tax bases of the U.S. and Europe through Afghanistan and back into the hands of the transnational security elite. Two decades of U.S. occupation brought us nothing but ruin and loss of lives. And while the mainstream media tried to portray a rosy picture of Afghanistan, the leaks by Assange and contrary revealed bloody atrocities committed by the U.S. and NATO occupying forces. For instance, in 2007, the U.S. Special Forces dropped 62,000 pounds bombs on a compound where they believed a high-value individual was hiding. However, locals reported that up to 300 civilians had been killed in this raid. None of the media reported that incident. According to reliable sources, about 241,000 Afghans have been killed by crossfire between the U.S. forces and the Taliban, of whom 48,000 civilians have been killed by U.S. occupation forces in a number of unknown incidents. But in my belief, the real number is much, much higher as many incidents are not reported and not documented. Well, the U.S. occupation has also inflicted invisible wounds. In 2009, the former Afghan Ministry of Public Health reported that fully two-thirds of Afghans suffer from mental health problems. The war has exacerbated the effects of poverty, malnutrition, poor sanitation, lack of access to health care, and environmental degradation on Afghans' health. Therefore, U.S. and NATO allies are responsible and accountable for all the past 20 years' misery of our tormented people, particularly our elevated women. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to be among you all today in this tribunal, and I hope Julian Assange will be free soon. Thank you. Uh, our next member of the tribunal, and I'm really glad that she's here uh, in person, is uh, Deepa Govindarayan Driver, uh, who is a lecturer, a trade unionist, and a legal observer at Julian Assange's extradition hearings. Uh, so I think at this moment uh, it would be very useful and great if we could hear uh, about your experience. How did these extradition hearings actually look like, and why could they also present a sort of legal crime? if I'm not using too harsh words, but I'm a philosopher, so you will forgive me. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I am testifying to this tribunal about what I observed and what I have been made aware of in the case of a journalist and publisher who has revealed corruption in Kenya, murder, rape, and torture in Iraq and Afghanistan, toxic waste dumping off the Ivory Coast, systematic manipulation of the law, and state-sanctioned torture at Guantanamo, and of course the role of other so-called 
advanced Western democracies in subverting democracies all over the world and sustaining war and torture and for the purpose of increasing weapons sales and intelligence operations. Um, states across the world have a, have a long history of extolling human rights and um, supposedly supporting press freedom while willfully interpreting or misinterpreting the law to silence dissidents. We see this today in the case of Daniel Hale, entombed at the Communication Management Unit in the US, and Stephen Donziger, who was under house arrest and now sentenced to prison, and of course, closer to home in the case of Craig Murray, sitting in a Scottish jail during a COVID outbreak. In the case of Julian, what I have witnessed has, um, against the grandeur and the, and the beauty of the beautiful courts and the, uh, the formality of the courtroom and the respect shown and the deference shown to the judges, is cruel treatment. Now, this cruel treatment goes back a long way. It includes isolation and confinement, deprivation of sunlight and association, a huge amount of physical and emotional trauma, which then turns into degrading treatment in the courtroom where uh, the defendant who is known to have a serious mental health condition as a result of uh, five nation states stamping on virtually on his head um, and having to kneel in the courtroom given that he is somebody who has osteoporosis and speak to his lawyers through a small gap in, in, the, in the plexiglass. It is seen in the being given a laptop with the keys glued down so that he is able to, so that they can pretend that there is a defense being mounted in this case when actually he is not being given the right to talk to his lawyers in any depth. He is denied his glasses for a period of three months when he first ent entered Belmarsh. And he, of course, has serious neurological and other symptoms, including the lasting effects of physical torture, for example, from a shoulder injury, which took place since 2012, and teeth injury, which has taken place. You know, many of us know how painful it is to have a sore tooth, but to have your tooth pulp uh, exposed and not to be allowed to leave the embassy to get medical treatment is indeed cruel and inhumane treatment. He also experiences, of course, hypervigilance and flashbacks. And these are the result of a continuous and long smearing campaign, which has been sustained through lawfare, where, where accusations and court processes have been kept in limbo to prevent justice. And the British state has been very complicit in this, including Keir Starmer's CPS. We're also interested in, of course, the, the complete and utter denial of access to the attorneys during the, under the guise of the pandemic to prevent Julian from even receiving the documentation or being served the second superseding indictment until the first day of trial the co constant contesting of the use of witnesses and the judges um, engaging in many arbitrary detentions, the serious conflicts of interest that we can see amongst judges who have a son who is um, you know, linked to Dark Trace, which is a, com which is a company that um, militates against data leaks and who has a husband who is deeply connected to the military establishment. We are concerned about judges who, who cause people to, who are like 90-year-old Daniel Ellsberg to be called at 4 a.m. in the morning or 5 a.m. in the morning in the U.S. To, to provide testimony when there are other time slots available. We're also concerned about other uh, clearly uh, despicable processes, such as we have seen in the case of Abdel Rahim al-Dashiri in Guantanamo, where a mic was placed in his room and a similar thing being done in relation to Julian in the use of laser microphones to, to, um, to spy on privileged legal conversations, to spy on medical conversations, and to prevent Julian from having any reasonable chance to defend himself. And lastly, uh, the, the presence of a process which seems to provide a semblance of justice when actually um, what is taking place in these courts is a complete and utter travesty and an injustice. And I, I urge you 
to stand with everybody on this tribunal as we watch the war criminals, as we watch the judges, and as we watch those like Julian, Craig, and others who stand up for the truth and stand up for us because torture is aimed at destroying not just individuals, but also the will of communities. We stand together against this torture and against the ill treatment and dehumanization of Julian Assange. <sighs> Thanks a lot for your important contribution and thank you for reminding us that uh, Julian Assange during the hearings is entrapped, caged in plexiglass. Uh, so I guess everyone here uh, uh, might remember who was the other one famous person, a war criminal who was also in a, in a, in a, in a glass cage. It was Adolf Eichmann a war criminal guilty of genocide. And on the other side here in the UK, which tells a lot about the legal system in this country, uh, you have a whistleblower, a publisher, a journalist put in a glass cage uh, through which he cannot even communicate to his lawyers. So much about the legal system in the UK. Uh, the next uh, uh, speaker and member of the tribunal is uh, Renata Villa, a human rights lawyer and formerly also a lawyer of WikiLeaks. Thanks, Renata, for joining. Good afternoon, my name is Renata Avila. Today, the 22nd of October of 2021, we are gathering here at the Belmarsh Tribunal to discuss, to study carefully, and to denounce to the world a series of uh, human rights violations perpetrated against Julian Assange by the government of the United States and the government of the United Kingdom with the assistance of their allies and with the complicity and silence of many mainstream media outlets. I have been part of Julian's legal team over the last 11 years or more. And over this time, I have witnessed an unprecedented case of lawfare. What is lawfare? Lawfare is when the case is used not, when the law is used to attack, to destroy, to undermine someone instead of using to protect and defend what is good in society. And what is good in society is to have a free press. And what is good in society is to have freedom of exercising journalism and the right to know and the right to truth. And that, that those are the rights and those are the values that Julian Assange upholds. Even during his arbitrary detention and that has extended over the years, even in periods of harsh isolation, he had defended and upholded those rights. But there's also another right together with the vi terrible violations to, to his right to work and he right, his right to a family and his right to a free freedom and that uh, had been exercised against him. And that has been a massive violation of his privacy, the privacy of his family, the pri privacy of his friends, and more seriously, the privacy of his lawyers. I experienced that firsthand. To my surprise this year, no authority contacted me, uh, no member of the US prosecution team or the UK prosecution uh, team uh, um, contacted me to, to ask me uh, if I wanted to open an investigation because it was exposed that my computer, that my legal documents, that my files, were used against my client in the Julian's process. So not only I had to go uh, in each and every meeting inside the embassy through an unprecedented level of surveillance by private security company and by all the agencies that were like, as it has been exposed recently by the press surveilling us, uh, to, the, to the degree that I had to whisper in the ear of my client and to scribble things hidden from cameras to communicate and prepare a legal defense in the multiple cases against him. But also during my visits, my computer was compromised and evidence was hand handed over uh, to the United States of my files, of my personal information, all information of my client. That violation of ethics, that violation of my right to exercise uh, as a lawyer to practice in private and to have the private discussions with my clients were completely ignored by two governments. And it should be completely dismissed as evidence, but I don't want to go to the details. What I want to convey today is 
a strong message from beginning to end, from beginning to today. This case is weak. This case is not a, a, a legal case, it's a political persecution and revenge. And the revenge, why revenge? Why revenge? If, uh, what, uh, the only thing that Julian did was to expose the truth. It's a revenge because they cannot, the, the, only, the only thing that they, that they can try is to silence him. But we have seen with many revelations over the years, with the crisis in Afghanistan this year, how overwhelming the truth is, how overwhelming and how accurate the information exposed for WikiLeaks was. Uh, we have in our hands, and we have this tribunal as a vehicle to expose the unprecedented violation of rights that go beyond the rights of Julian Assange and the legal team and his family and his friends. The violation of rights that we have witnessing today is the violation of your rights, is the violation of your right to know, is the violation of your right to tr truth, justice, and accountability. I hope this tribunal finds both the government of the United States and the government of the United Kingdom guilty of this crime. And I hope that this sends a very strong message to end this case now. Thank you, members of the tribunal. I'm happy to provide. Thank you, uh, Renat, as a member of uh, the tribunal. And thank you also for mentioning a very important detail. And uh, this was revealed uh, uh, in El Pais uh, that uh, everyone, including the lawyers uh, who were visiting the Ecuadorian embassy in London, were spied on directly or indirectly by the CIA. Uh, I wear it as a badge of honor that I was also spied on. Uh, and the next speaker, uh, an investigative journalist, one of the best investig investigative journalists today, Stefania Maurizi, uh, from Italy was also spied on, uh, her phones were opened, her computers were opened, uh, people were surveilled, uh, and probably this is not finished yet. Uh, but Stefania will speak about uh, another perspective of Julian Assange's case, and thanks a lot for joining us today. So good afternoon, and uh, I'm honored to be here uh, at the Belmarsh <clears throat> Tribunal. Let me introduce myself. I'm an Italian investigative journalist who has spent over a decade working on all WikiLeaks secret documents. I have done this hard work for my newspaper, initially the Italian leading news, uh, newspaper, news magazine L'Espresso and the Italian daily La Repubblica and currently for the major Italian daily Fatto Quotidiano. It was only thanks to Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks journalists, uh, journalists and their sources, especially Chelsea Manning, that I have been able to reveal crucial information in the public interest, such as war crimes in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, tortures in Guantanamo from Iraq to Guantanamo, extrajudicial killings by drones, political pressures to grant impunity to state criminals involved in the extraordinary, in the CIA extraordinary rendition program. And it was only thanks to Julian Assange that I, uh, I was able to reveal how my country, Italy, has become the launching pad for US wars from Iraq to the secret drone war. I have published thousands of investigations and articles based on such a revelation. But while I have been able to, to do this journalistic work completely safely, with, I was never arrested, I was never questioned, Julian Assange has been destroyed. Let me use this strong word, he has been destroyed. For me, it has been very, very sad to witness how he has been how he has been crushed, destroyed. And the way he has been treated should make you very, very angry. It's a massive scandal. Uh, it's not uh, an exaggeration to call it a massive scandal. I'm here to call out to the US authorities, the UK authorities, the Swedish authorities, the Australian authorities, and the Ecuadorian authorities under Lenin Moreno for such massive scandal. 
I have spent the last six years fighting court to access the full documentation on the case under the freedom of information laws. I have done this because I think it's crucial to get the facts, to reconstruct the facts um, uh, rigorously, to have uh, solid evidence. I have been fighting in the, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in Sweden and in Australia. I'm represented by seven lawyers. I'm doing this work completely alone just because I want, I don't want these people to win. I want to discover what they have done. I want to unearth evidence of their abusive, horrific treatment of Julian Assange. And I have, and I want facts. Four powerful nations are using all their legal resources to deny a journalist access to the documentation on the case. It means that this documentation is something like dynamite. Had they been bureaucratic correspondence, they would have never spent the last six years trying to fighting against my uh, attempt to access it. But in any case, even if um, it, I experienced such a rubber wall uh, thanks to this five year, six years uh, litigation in US, UK, uh, Sweden, Australia. I have been able, uh, was able to obtain some really important documents, very, very few, but indeed very relevant, uh, because they provide indisputable evidence that it was the UK authorities, the UK Crown Prosecution Service, then headed by Sir Keir Starmer, which contributed to create the legal and diplomatic quagmire, which has kept Julian Assange arbitrarily detained since 2010, and finally resulted in his arrest and in his detention in Belmarsh. And it was the Crown Prosecution Service, which was against the Swedish prosecutors dropping the case in 2013 when they were considering to do doing so. Why did the Crown Prosecution Service behave like this? Why did they write to the Swedish prosecutors, don't you get, get cold feet? I'm quoting from official documents. No one can dispute these official documents because they have been provided to me after years of litigation, litigation by the UK authorities and other authorities involved in this case. And why did the Crown Prosecution Service write to the Swedish counterpart, please do not think that the case is being dealt with as just another extradition request? When I try to dig into these facts and try to understand why the Crown Prosecution Service had behaved like this, the Crown Prosecution Service gave me a pretty incredible answer. They said they had destroyed the documents about this case. And even if the case was still ongoing, highly controversial and very high profile, it's incredible to me that they destroyed such documents. And it's even more incredible that they don't even know what the document contained. They claim so. They, they say that they don't know what the document contained. And they have been fighting years trying to discover why they destroyed this document and what the document contained. You have to realize that the Crown Prosecution Service, which was in, in charge of, the, of this attempt to extradite Julian Assange to Sweden, is the very same agency in charge of the extradition to the US. The very, very same agency. The US is acting through the Crown Prosecution Service. And the Crown Prose Prosecution Service has such a record. It's the agency which did this during the Swedish case, it's the agency which destroyed the documents, though the case was still ongoing. It's the agency which claim they don't even know what they destroyed. So I wonder whether uh, the, during our litigation, the Crown Prosecution Service made no mystery that they are dealing with this extradition, the extradition of a publisher who revealed war crime, as if they are extra 
indicting um, a criminal like any other, a drug dealer or perhaps a mafia killer. So it's time to demand transparency and accountability from the Crown Prosecution Service in the handling of the Julian Assange case from the very beginning. And it's time for the journalists, activists, and the public opinion to call out the US and the UK authorities, especially the judicial authorities, for this monstrous injustice. Free Julian Assange, drop the charges, jail the war criminals. The next to testify is the former president of Ecuador uh, from 2007 to 2017. Uh, during, his during whose presidency Julian Assange got the political asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, Rafael Correa. Señores magistrados, señoras y señores, los saluda Rafael Correa, presidente constitucional de la República del Ecuador desde el año 2007 al 2017. Para mí es un gran honor estar el día de hoy con ustedes en el tribunal de Belmars y contribuir a la verdad histórica contribuir a la justicia. En junio del 2012, el periodista australiano Julian Assange entró en nuestra embajada en Londres y pidió el asilo del Estado ecuatoriano. Casi dos meses después y luego de una profunda investigación, un extenso informe, dicho asilo en ejercicio de nuestro derecho soberano fue otorgado, sobre todo fundamentado en que no había las garantías para el debido proceso puesto que había un riesgo cierto, real, de que Julian Assange fuese extraditado a los Estados Unidos, donde ya había sido condenado por los medios de comunicación y donde querían aplicar una ley que incluía la pena de muerte. Pena prohibida en todos los instrumentos interamericanos de derechos humanos, en todos los instrumentos mundiales. Jamás fue nuestra intención interferir con la justicia sueca, Siempre estuvieron abiertas las puertas de la embajada para que se interrogue a Julian Assange. Julian Assange ni siquiera estaba acusado en Suecia. Querían interrogarlo. Eso se puede hacer en la embajada. Lo habían hecho antes. La Fiscalía Sueca no lo quiso hacer. Al final lo hizo, después de muchos años, cuatro o cinco años, demostrándose que siempre pudo interrogar a Julian Assange en la embajada del Ecuador en Londres. Jamás fue nuestra intención interferir con la justicia sueca, pero sí defender los derechos humanos de alguien que había solicitado el asilo del Estado ecuatoriano. En mayo 24 del 2017 entregué democráticamente el gobierno a mi sucesor Lenín Moreno. Ya el 30 de mayo se reunía con Paul Manafort, ex jefe de campaña de Donald Trump. Esto se conoce porque ustedes saben que Paul Manafort ha sido condenado, se declaró culpable de lavado de activos y otros cargos. Y en esa investigación del FBI de Estados Unidos Varios testimonios indicaron que el 30 de mayo Paul Manafort se había reunido con Lenín Moreno, una semana nada más tenía el presidente Lenín Moreno, en Quito, y que Lenín Moreno había ofrecido entregar a Julian Assange a cambio de financiamiento a los Estados Unidos. Luego, pues, realmente Julian Assange lo que, lo que recibió fue una tortura en la embajada ecuatoriana, maltratándolo quitándole muchos servicios, muchos derechos, comunicaciones, internet, espiándolo deliberadamente y presionándolo para que decidiera salir por sus propios medios de la embajada, lo cual no lograron. Finalmente, después de un acoso brutal, inhumano, atentatorio a los derechos humanos de Julian Assange, por primera vez en historia un gobierno permite que entre una fuerza armada a su embajada y la policía británica entra en la embajada del Ecuador para capturar a Julian Assange y el Estado ecuatoriano entrega a Julian Assange. Quiero decirles que esto también contradice totalmente, brutalmente, frontalmente, la constitución ecuatoriana que dice, leo, artículo 41, se reconocen los derechos de asilo y refugio, de acuerdo con la ley y los instrumentos internacionales de derechos humanos. Las personas que se encuentren en condición de asilo o refugio gozarán de protección especial que garantice el pleno ejercicio de sus derechos. El Estado respetará y garantizará el principio de no devolución. Repito, el Estado respetará y garantizará el principio de no devolución. Artículo 41, Constitución del Ecuador, 
este artículo fue destrozado por el gobierno moreno, nadie dijo nada a nivel nacional, porque la prensa es cómplice de esto, la prensa ecuatoriana, y a nivel internacional tampoco, ¿no? Porque todo el caso de Iván Sanz fue terriblemente politizado. Quiero decirles que yo no conozco personalmente a Julián Assange. No necesariamente he hablado una vez con él antes del asilo, cuando me entrevistó para Rosa Today. Jamás he hablado telefónicamente siquiera con él después de que fue asilado. Y no es que necesariamente concuerdo con todo lo que hizo, pero sí con sus derechos humanos de tener un proceso justo. Y si estoy totalmente en contra de la doble moral, Sé, como ex jefe de Estado, que los Estados requieren mantener cierta información confidencial, pero no se puede tener en la confidencialidad crímenes de guerra, crímenes de lesa humanidad. Y no se puede perseguir y condenar al que devela esos crímenes, más aún, ser perseguido por los criminales, por los que cometieron esos crímenes. Ojalá se inaugure la justicia, ojalá se ponga fin a tanta doble moral, ojalá se ponga fin al suplicio de un ser humano como Julian Assange, que lo que dijo fue la verdad. Un inmenso abrazo y mucha suerte. El mayor de los éxitos en el sentido de que prevalezca la justicia, la verdad, en este proceso. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, Mr. Correa. Y uh, thanks everyone uh, for your patience. Uh, the next one is uh, Annie Machon. Uh, I hope I pronounced it well. Uh, blame it on my Balkan origin and my Balkan English. Uh, she is a whistleblower and a former intelligence officer of MI5. It is my very great pleasure to join you today um, to support Julian Assange and to hope for the best in his legal case. And I come to this area because I myself was a whistleblower many, many years ago, because I used to work in the early to mid 1990s as an intelligence officer for the British security service, MI5. And it, that was where I met my former partner and colleague, a man called David Shaler, who became a very notorious whistleblower in the late 1990s. And by doing so, we automatically broke the draconian terms of the Official Secrets Act in the UK. And we fled the UK, went on the run literally for a month around Europe, lived in hiding in a remote French farmhouse for a year and then another two years in exile in Paris. I and our family and our friends and even some journalists were arrested around the scandal of this case and David himself paid a very heavy price. He went to prison not once but twice. First of all when the British tried to extradite him from France um, but failed in 1998 and also when he returned voluntarily and then was put on trial under the Official Secrets Act and went back to prison. So it was a very difficult seven years and we had to work exclusively of course at that point with the mainstream media, the old legacy media, which because of various um, laws in place and various ways that the British establishment can control the uh, mainstream media in the UK, meant that they can sometimes uh, work as a blockage. There was also a slight problem because David took carefully curated um, documents, nothing containing agent names, to his journalist um, co-workers. And those documents were held by the, the newspaper and those documents were handed over when the police came knocking with a production order. So the proof of what David was saying was lost because of this. So fast forward to 2009 when I first had the pleasure of meeting Julian Assange and he was describing the vision of WikiLeaks, which was to get rid of that sort of media blockage, the old media blockage, and present information directly from the whistleblower to the citizens so that they could make up their own minds about whatever it was, corruption of intelligence agencies, corruption of government, corruption of big corporations around the world. And for this, rightly, he has been lauded as one, a high-tech publisher of incredible vision, and two, as an award-winning journalist. And this takes me on to his current situation because he is being persecuted for being a publisher and being a journalist. And yet his vision with WikiLeaks was to protect the whistleblowers and not persecute them, to you know, offer a degree of anonymity, to offer a degree of proof to show exactly what they were revealing. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have built, both technologically and from a humane point of view, and also as a media outlet. So I salute him for that. 
However, despite all, all these awards and all these plaudits, he is not being accorded the same degree of respect as other more mainstream old style journalists have been for exposing exactly the same situation. Most notably, what is known in the US as the uh, New York Times example, where they were working at one point very closely with WikiLeaks, producing information that uh, WikiLeaks had given them, and yet they are not being prosecuted, but WikiLeaks uh, founder Julian Assange is. We also have another very weird case of um, a guy called Christopher Steele, who was a former MI6 intelligence officer, who has now set up his own mercenary spy company for hire. And he was the person who created what became known as the dirty dossier on Donald Trump and his visit to Russia, which has been discredited. And he was then sued by some Russian oligarchs in the US courts. And he has been accorded US First Amendment rights, which is the freedom of expression. And this basically means that even though he is a UK citizen and resident in the UK, not in America, not a US citizen, he can have First Amendment rights as a journalist and a publisher under US law. And yet this is precisely what is being specifically denied to Assange if he were to be extradited to the USA. Um, this is something I find absolutely disgusting. So I just really want to finish by saying, um, it has been a pleasure over the years to meet with Julian Assange. Um, he is one of the most ferociously bright people I've ever met, but also very good company and incredibly witty and very humane and protective of whistleblowers who might be vulnerable um, going forward and trying to expose the crimes that their fellow citizens should be able to read about. I really hope in this particular case coming up at the end of October, just for once, that UK justice will prevail, do the decent thing, and release this very brave, very courageous, um, very visionary and very humane man so that he can try and rebuild his life. And um, potentially the legacy he has left with WikiLeaks is going to preserve and protect other whistleblowers in the future. So all courage to Julian Assange. In 1971, uh, Vladimir Dedier and Jean-Paul Sartre published an article in the New York Times Review of Books uh, where they speak about uh, the importance of Pentagon Papers. 50 years later, I'm really proud to say that one of the greatest whistleblowers in history, Daniel Ellsberg, is joining the Belmar Tribunal. Hi, I'm Dan Ellsberg. Fifty years ago, I was the first American to be prosecuted facing the same charges that Julian Assange is facing today. In my case, I copied 7,000 pages of top secret material that realized the history of Vietnam as a history of lies, law-breaking, war crimes, many of the things that the government was concerned to conceal from the public. And uh, it was the first set of prosecuting because Having fought a revolutionary war against an empire, a product of that revolutionary war was our First Amendment, which forbids legislation that would abridge freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Obviously, to go against me as a source raised questions about whether that was really constitutional, and that's never been fully decided yet by the Supreme Court, which hasn't addressed that case. But the case against Julian as a journalist uh, obviously contradicts the First Amendment's protection of freedom of the press. That's the first prosecution that has gone against the journalist. And if Julian is extradited and prosecuted and probably convicted in our court by recent precedent of new judges in court, that will be the first time that a journalist, but it won't be the last. Every journalist will have a target on his back from that time on, and not only Americans, Julian himself is not American and did not take the oath of an American official to uphold our Constitution, which is violated every time these secrets of crimes and deception and lawbreaking are concealed from the public. Uh, if Julian were an American official, having revealed this, he would be fulfilling that oath in a way that almost none of his colleagues have ever done. But in my case, there's further analogy. When I was being prosecuted for the Pentagon Papers revelation, which ended in 1968 before President Nixon was in office, who prosecuted me, he was afraid that I had information and documents about crimes he was committing and lies he was making, which I did, although not 
as much as he feared. But to keep me from revealing that, he took criminal acts against me, illegal, warrantless wiretapping, uh, overheard many times, and even in a, uh, a psychological profile of me by the CIA uh, meant to uh, manipulate me, if possible, and actually uh, sent CIA assets, men who were veterans of the Bay of Pigs operation, to incapacitate Daniel Ellsberg totally on the steps of the Capitol in a rally on May 3rd, 1972. Uh, they actually didn't do that, obviously, because they feared they were being set up to be caught and, uh, and backed off from it. But it did show a willingness of the president the government actually to commit crimes against an American citizen uh, in order to keep wrongful secrets. Exactly the same has been revealed about Julian Assange. We now know that uh, see, uh, contractors were carrying out illegal surveillance, even of his talks with lawyers and doctors in the Ecuadorian FC. Uh, information was going to our covert operations to CIA, probably to NSA as well. And they even considered seriously kidnapping him or killing him with perhaps poison. Just as I say, an effort was made, was actually carried out, but uh, not fully, to incapacitate me. In my case, once crimes revealed, my case was dismissed. And in fact, they figured in the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon, which actually made, uh, brought Nixon out of office and made the war endable nine months later. The revelation of these acts against Julian Assange should obviously result in his, in the dismissal of all charges against him. And prior to that, uh, an English judge taking account of this should maintain her forbidding of extradition and uh, reject uh, President Biden's shameful appeal uh, of that order to extradite Julian. Our freedom of the press depends on it. Julian Assange's health very clearly depends on it. But more broadly, uh, our ability to learn the truth about what is being done in our name. Uh, our next one, uh, next member of the tribunal to testify is Ben Wiesner uh, from the American Civil Liberties Union, and uh, he was also the lead attorney of Edward Snowden. Let's continue. Hi, this is Ben Wiesner. I'm an attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union in New York. Uh, for the last eight years, I've had the privilege of being the principal legal advisor to NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden. Uh, it's an honor to be with you virtually today for this important event. Uh, my brief remarks are going to focus on the threat that the prosecution of Julian Assange poses to press freedom both in the United States and abroad. Uh, recently, a coalition of press freedom groups in the United States petitioned the Department of Justice to drop the extradition request and to drop the charges against Julian Assange because of the existential threat that this prosecution poses to national security investigative journalism. Uh, now, the U.S. government would have you believe uh, that this case does not implicate press freedom because Julian Assange is not a journalist and WikiLeaks is not a traditional publisher. Rather, uh, they engaged in a criminal conspiracy uh, to bring true facts to the public of the United States and the world. Uh, well, I am here to say that all national security investigative journalism properly understood is a criminal conspiracy. Uh, good journalists conspire with sources to liberate information from government classification regimes and share it with the public uh, in the public interest uh, in support of democracy. And almost all of the most important stories about US government misconduct in the war on terror, uh, we have learned because courageous sources uh, and enterprising journalists have published that information even though it was classified at the highest level of secrecy. So if not for courageous whistleblowers and enterprising, enterprising journalists, uh, we would not have known that the U.S. tortured and sexually humiliated prisoners in Abu Ghraib, that the CIA operated a network of secret prisons outside the law, uh, that drone strikes routinely killed civilians and not just their intended targets, 
that the U.S. established a global network of mass surveillance without the consent of the public. These and many other stories we learned only because of that conspiracy, uh, the conspiracy to bring the truth to the public against the wishes of governments. Uh, and so there is no meaningful way to distinguish this case, uh, which says that Julian Assange committed a crime by helping to publish uh, evidence of war crimes released to him allegedly by Chelsea Manning, uh, and the kind of national security journalism that routinely wins the highest journalism awards around the world. Um, but I think there's a second reason why this case is a particular threat to press freedom globally that has not received enough attention. Uh, and that is that to me it is the height of hubris for the United States to suggest in this indictment that our own secrecy laws bind foreign publishers. Uh, Mr. Assange is an Australian publisher. Uh, he never agreed to be bound by U.S. secrecy law. Uh, and for the U.S. to drag him uh, across the ocean uh, into a U.S. prison, into a U.S. court, uh, and charge him with felonies for doing that will set a hugely dangerous precedent around the globe. Uh, every day, journalists from U.S. newspapers, U.K. newspapers, The New York Times and The Guardian pry loose and publish secrets of foreign governments. Uh, the New York Times has, in the last years, published top uh, secrets from the government of China, from the governments of Iran, um, and one can imagine how the U.S. government would respond uh, if Iran or China tried to extradite the U.S. reporters or their publishers for having violated those countries' secrecy laws. Uh, we would cry bloody murder, and we should, uh, and that's because uh, it makes no sense um, in this world uh, for each country to be able to bind the rest of the world uh, to our own regressive secrecy laws like the U.S. Espionage Act. And so I worry that if this case is allowed to go forward, uh, if Mr. Assange finds himself in a U.S. courtroom, uh, the next time uh, a country like China or Iran uh, demands the extradition of a French journalist, a British journalist, an American journalist, of course our governments won't comply but they'll have no principled basis for not doing so. We will have essentially opened the door uh, to every country uh, enforcing its overbroad secrecy regime in this way. Um, so let me close by saying that right now this issue is in the courts. The courts like to believe that they are immune to public pressure and public opinion, but I can assure you that the opposite is true. They are paying a lot of attention um, to how this case will be received by the public. And if the public is quiet, uh, then they will think that they can move ahead with an extradition and a prosecution. Um, but if the public is loud uh, and the public says this is unacceptable in our open societies for us to go forward with a prosecution like that, the judges will hear it. So my message to you today is let them hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, and now the moment has come to, to greet uh, a great guest, a member of the tribunal uh, who is joining us live from Moscow. Uh, this is Edward Snowden. I'm sure we don't need more introduction who he is. I think everyone knows who he is. And I'm really thankful, Ed, for joining us today and raising your voice at the Belmarsh Tribunal. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be with you. It, it's difficult to be here. I, struggle to understand how we can be here after so many years. Uh, there has been, there have been so many stories told. There's been so much criticism. Uh, there has been so much deception. And where has it brought us? Uh, has this been constructive? Is this a victory for us, for the state, for humanity, for our rights? Um, when I came forward in 2013, uh, I said the reason that I came forward uh, was that we have a right to know uh, that which is done to us and that which is done in our name by our governments. Uh, that was already under threat. And when you look at the world since, uh, it, it seems that that trend is accelerating. Do we still have that right? Do we have any rights uh, if we don't defend them? Well, today we see someone who has stood up to defend that right, uh, who has aggressively championed that right at an extreme cost. Uh, and it's time for us to defend his rights. What we're witnessing is a murder that passes without comment. Uh, and, I, and I want to say uh, that it is difficult for me to comprehend the spectacle of uh, the, the press of a nation or 
the, the developed world, uh, aiding and abetting with full knowledge, uh, a crime not only against this man, but against our public interest. However, at, at this moment, that we are, we, we all see this, we all feel it. Uh, it, it. It's no less familiar than the shoes on my feet. Everywhere we look, from Afghanistan to economics, from pandemic to pervasive surveillance, the obvious has been made unspeakable. Uh, it has become unspeakable because the truth of our circumstances could be taken as evidence in the defense of the actions of the out of favor. And in the eyes of the American state, few represent this class, a greater object of hatred than the person of Julian Assange. Uh, he has been charged as a political criminal, uh, something that I understand quite well, but he has been charged as the purest sort of political criminal for having committed the transgression of choosing the wrong side. The, the charges, which are the, the are absolutely an unadorned legal fiction, uh, we we are told to believe uh, that the state has these these powers over what can be said and what can't be said, the, the things that can and cannot be said. But what happens if we permit that? Where does that lead? What are we? Can we be said to be free if even our power to express ourselves, to understand the facts of our world can be uh, fenced off from us, that we look beyond through the gauze, through the veil, at what could be the facts of the world, uh, but we're not permitted to um, acquire them. Julian Assange did not accept that, and the charges against him reduced to an allegation to commit the crime of journalism uh, in the first degree. Which is to say, when we look at it applied elsewhere, the same sort of publication of classified material that we see in the New York Times or the Washington Post, aggravated by a conspiracy to accomplish the same, which is simply uncovering an uncomfortable truth. But something distinguishes Julian Assange from the greatest newspapers of our day, and that is his independence. Uh, Julian Assange is not a person who will be told no lightly. I remember uh, in the case of 2013, when I came forward and revealed evidence of mass surveillance, uh, which the government uh, of my country had uh, constructed the apparatus of mass surveillance, uh, an entire scheme that spanned the globe, uh, with the participation of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and of course, the United Kingdom. And when the newspapers of all of these countries began publishing uh, these things, one of the papers who held uh, the archive of material originally included uh, The Guardian, uh, who was headquartered in uh, the United Kingdom, still is. Uh, and I remember reading a, a story, of course, I wasn't there for it personally, I'm getting this second hand. Uh, who knows what we can rely on in this, the state of journalism as it is today. But they were approached by the British state who said, okay, okay, uh, you've had your fun, you've done enough, now it's time to stop. And they uh, had to send their archival material away to the United States, to a partner uh, publication, because they no longer uh, believed that they were safe to continue publishing. And they were right. Uh, agents of the British state went to the Guardian. Uh, they destroyed their laptop computers. They've got it on film. Uh, putting angle grinders to computer chips, trying to erase any trace that, that these stories had been written uh, from within the, uh, the confines of the newsroom. Now, Julian was not deterred uh, by that, and he never would be. Uh, when you perform the level of surveillance uh, against a person that has clearly been performed and is being performed, even today, certainly in prison, uh, against Julian Assange. You understand at least something about that character. You understand uh, what the breaking point is. You know what it'll take uh, to make them bend. Um, and he didn't bend. Uh, he will break before he does. He has consistently and continuously dared to speak the unspeakable in the face of opposition. 
uh, in the face of power. And that is a remarkable and rare thing. That is the reason that Julian Assange sits in prison today. If you love the truth, as I, I think everyone here does, you, you wouldn't be listening to this, you wouldn't be watching this, you wouldn't be participating in this, you wouldn't care about this unless something in you told you that something important was happening here. Uh, and if you do care, as I think you do, uh, you are a criminal of the same category as Julian Assange. In the eyes of the state, uh, what differentiates you, what divides you from him, is only the degree. We share the same guilt. Each of us share in the crime, uh, and we are <laughs> unindicted co-conspirators in his quest to raise a lantern in the halls of power. Each of us shares in the forbidden desire to see justice done not merely to the instruments of these darkest moments uh, of the human condition that we've heard about all day here, uh, torture, extrajudicial killings, uh, aggressive war, uh, but to see justice done to their architects. And I have to say um, here, each of us will also share, and to me it will happen without the faintest regret in his ultimate fate, if we do not stop what is happening now. What is happening to Julian Assange is a crime, and he must be freed. If we're going to free the world, we have to free Assange. Thank you, and stay free. Thanks a lot, Edward Snowden, uh, for joining the Belmarsh Tribunal today. Let me uh, invite uh, my dear friend and the original member of the Sartre Russell Tribunal, Tariq Ali, to conclude this tribunal today. Um, I think it's been an extremely useful meeting, a wide variation of views, very useful information which has been provided for us. And I am particularly happy myself that there are members of parliament present because uh, this is a body which has very few members who in fact defend and fight for things they should be fighting. So very grateful to Jeremy, Absana, Comrade Bergen, John McDonnell uh, for, for you know, making it possible to come here. We need, I would have thought, some bill at least presented in Parliament demanding, even if it's just signed by people, demanding Julian's immediate release after the uh, uh, trial if it takes place. So with that, I declare this session of the tribunal closed.